Mm. <laughs> well, it, it, you might call it suicide, or you might call it physics, or you might call it electrochemistry. Uh, it, the electric car, uh, it's sort of like the Terminator. It keeps on coming back, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but never seriously. Uh, there's an article in today's newspaper about the Volt and how few Volts were actually sold and how they were, that many was sold only because they were giving them a huge discount and a big subsidy from the U.S. government. The problem with the electric car is the battery technology is developing very slowly. And investors in electric cars, people who invest in companies like Tesla, I think had a mistaken idea that we would have some sort of Moore's Law for batteries and the price would come way down once there was a market for it. And I've talked to the battery experts, some of them at LBL, and uh, no, the battery technology is too difficult. The problem is you have to recharge the battery. If you imagine a battery, you have two, two electrodes and electrolyte, and these molecules move across and they reach the other side. If you want to recharge, they have to move back. And if they don't go back to the same place, you have a different geometry. In particular, they tend to grow dendrites. And, and these can short out the battery, of course, other problems, lower voltage and so on. So it's a, it's a really difficult technology problem, developing batteries. And they keep on improving, but very slowly. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, for the electric car, if you include in the cost of replacing the battery when it goes dead after several years, and they all do, uh, then, then the price of running an electric car is much higher than that of a, of a gasoline car. So ultimately, it was that economics and the ch chemistry and the physics of batteries uh, that, that are keeping the electric car down. On the other side, there are the people who are wildly enthusiastic about electric cars. I uh, have some friends who just love their Tesla, <laughs> uh, and they can afford it. The friends mm -hmm. I have are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. They don't care what the cost is. Um, so they keep it alive, and then there are the idealists who say, I want to go all electric because I want to be completely clean even though, of course, you're not, because the electricity is being generated typically by, by fossil fuels. Uh, but they, they love the ideal of the electric car. They love the fact that it has great acceleration when you're at rest, because that's when you get the maximum torque. So there are all these wonderful things about it, but it's expensive. And, of course, the ultimate problem is, unless the electric car is adopted by the developing world, um, it, 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 it really doesn't do that much good because that's where most of the carbon dioxide will be coming from. The fact is, if they go in a totally different direction and just push for lead-acid battery electric cars, then there is some potential there. Lead-acid battery cars are still more expensive than gasoline, but not a whole lot more. Uh, lead-acid uh, batteries are, are really relatively cheap. Uh, way of storing energy compared to the advanced lithium-ion batteries that we use. So there is some potential there. What you, the problem with, with lead-acid batteries is your range is very small. You may only get a 50-mile range. But in China, where people aren't already addicted to having 350-mile ranges to be able to go up to the mountains and back on one tank of gas, um, where a 50-mile range might sound very attractive, uh, there's still a potential for electric cars, for the cheap electric cars, for the lead-acid electric cars. Majority of, of hybrid vehicles and potentially even natural gas vehicles. Well, I think the hybrid vehicles are coming. I, I don't think we have to change anything. I, I think the idea of a hybrid vehicle is you use the battery only during periods when your, your, your gasoline engine is inefficient. Uh, or when you want to recover energy from going down a hill. And it gives you a boost. No matter what kind of car you have, you, you get a nice boost from hybrid energy, uh, engines. And, and so these, uh, I, I think they are the future and they are coming and they will grow. Um, for the natural gas vehicles, there, there's a, there are several problems. Uh, the biggest one is lack of infrastructure. The people who are using natural gas vehicles these days tend to be people who are parts of fleets, and they can afford to have a very large compressor uh, that they share that can then pump the natural gas into them. So, for example, taxis in San Francisco, I understand about half the fleet is natural gas. The taxi drivers like this because they have to pay for their own fuel, and natural gas is considerably cheaper than gasoline these days, so they make money. But compressors can be expensive. Um, ideally, we'd like to have a compressor in every home so you can fill up your gas tank at night from the natural gas that's already supplied to your home. But so far, those compressors have been a few thousand dollars, and it takes you a while before you can get that return from that
kind of investment. Not that many people don't, don't think it's worthwhile, particularly because you have the shorter range. I think the big immediate future in the United States for natural gas are going to be trucks and buses. Uh, they have the room to, to, to put in the, uh, the, the, the compressed gas tanks. I think liquid, liquid natural gas uh, the more iffy, uh, there are more dangers associated with it, the handling of low temperatures, the doers, and so on. But I think for compressed natural gas, it will be our truck fleets that will, will lead the way. And there, what we really need is an infrastructure. We need more stations that can supply the natural gas, uh, big pumping stations. Uh, and I, I would love to see the United States uh, offer incentives for the creation of natural gas supplies uh, at, at, our, at our truck stops. Energy security? Well, I, I think you have to recognize that energy security really means liquid energy security for our vehicles. We're not really running out of energy for electricity, for heating, we have, we have lots of that. Um, the, the, the issue is we import too much oil. And I think the, the, the best thing that he did there was to continue to push what are called the CAFE standards for the corporate average fuel economy. This is something where individual car companies can't simply improve the mileage of their cars. It doesn't sell well enough for people who like uh, the, 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 the more powerful cars. But by setting a standard across the industry, our fuel economy keeps on improving. And I think, I think that has, that's extremely important. If you would say, I'm going to remain equally focused on these two goals? I, I would say that um, helping develop the technology for using natural gas in our vehicles is, it should be very high. And this means several things. It, it means supporting, developing a clean fracking standard to make fracking acceptable and environmentally clean. Uh, this, this is something I think can be done in the near term. Have all the environmentalists jump on board and say, hey, if you do fracking that way, we will support it. That's a good thing to do. Uh, we also need to send that technology to China. But there are other things we can do too. And natural gas vehicles, compressed natural gas, have some limitations. As I said, they're good for trucks and buses, but they give you shorter range for automobiles. I'd like to see uh, incentives to develop an industry in the United States to convert our natural gas to liquid fuels that can be used in vehicles, whether it's gasoline, diesel fuel, or butanol, or some other substitute, uh, that uh, we have these huge natural gas resources, we need to exploit them, and we need to then convert them to liquid fuel. Now, there's been some hesitancy to do this because there is a strong environmental movement that I think has prematurely decided that anything having to do with fossil fuels is bad. And we have to switch away from fossil fuels so they support uh, wind, solar, uh, energy storage mecha mechanisms, things like that. Uh, I, I think that is, uh, is, is poorly thought out. I, I think what we really need to do is to have a several decades in which we can take advantage of the natural gas around the world, which uh, depending on its use, gives half to one-third uh, the uh, emissions of, 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 of coal. Uh, that's really important. A large fraction of the U.S. energy still comes from coal, though it's dropping. It's dropping because of natural gas. In China, the situation has reached a crisis stage. They need to switch from coal to natural gas, and it is urgent. Now, President Obama, in his first term, did set up a... Um, a, a joint um, system for exchanging information on this. I think that's one of the most important things that he did. It has not really developed as rapidly as it could, and, and we need to expand that even further.